Hello again, and welcome back. Uh, this time we're going to be returning uh, to some topics in the philosophy of mind uh, after starting with uh, dualism as a, 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 a large-scale view about the uh, about what minds are and about what human beings are like. Uh, uh, the text took a little bit of a, a slight vacation into talking about uh, identity, uh, specifically personal identity, uh, and uh, at this part of the text, uh, at this part of the chapter, returns to uh, issues in the philosophy of mind, is in uh, returning to the question, you know, what is a mind? What are uh, what are people like? Uh, not so much uh, when is uh, somebody the same person over time and through change. And so the topic we'll be taking a look at in in that vein is a uh, a successor of uh, dualism as a, a major view in the philosophy of mind. So uh, physicalism is the view that there are uh, that, that, that there's only matter, right? That, that when we explain what a mind is, uh, that we should not be dualists about it. Uh, that, that, that is, that there's no physical stuff and mind stuff, there's just the physical stuff, which is why the, the view is called physicalism. Uh, the view is sometimes also called materialism uh, because it's the view that th all that there is is matter, right, in, in, the, in the conventional sense. And so the first uh, uh, thinker that the textbook talks a lot about is uh, a, a bit famous in this regard uh, and uh, is uh, the philosopher Gilbert Ryle, who was uh, certainly a, a pretty harsh critic of the kind of picture of minds that is given to us by Descartes. Uh, and in fact, uh, Ryle sort of, you know, uh, uh, made fun of it, but, you know, calling Descartes' view, this sort of view of this ghost in the machine. Uh, but, you know, behind that, that sort of, uh, um, you know, uh, caricature, caricaturing of, of the view, uh, there are some very serious problems with Descartes' view that uh, Ryle does point out, uh, and uh, uh, some of the some of those include um, uh, the fact of, of of space and time. So if you again think back to Descartes' view, this view that um, you know, which of course was also Plato's view and, and many others in between, uh, that 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 we have a body, but, but but we also have a kind of a soul or spirit or mind stuff that sort of you know, in some sense, follows around. Or a lot of times we say it's in the body, right? It inhabits the body. Uh, but that's just exactly the kind of thing that that Ryle wants to point out as being barely coherent. Uh, so what does it mean to say that that this that the soul is inside anything, right? So if something doesn't exist in space and time, that is, if it's not made of matter, if it's not a physical thing, that it, that means it doesn't have a height, it doesn't have a width, it doesn't have a breadth, right? Uh, I mean, it doesn't uh, uh, have a duration. I mean, so if something is um, again, outside of space and time, the way that this concept of soul is supposed to be, then what does it even mean to say it's in anything, much less a body, which is made out of matter? And so the 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 very thought seems to indicate some kind of, uh, of incoherence. That is, the idea of dualism seems to be inconsistent with itself, uh, or certainly the way that uh, you're forced to talk about uh, minds and bodies and things like that. It makes you... Makes, makes you say things that seem uh, pretty inconsistent even with themselves. Uh, and, and Ryle really uh, very harshly criticizes some of those kinds of um, some of those kinds of views uh, and some of those consequences that dualism has. And in addition to his concerns about um, uh, the the soul just being, uh, you know, not not existing in space and time, uh, and uh, uh, you know, and yet us sort of talking as if it as if it does. Uh, he also points out that it seems like what's going on uh, with the dualist is that they make uh, what what Ryle famously calls a category mistake. Right. And so I'm going to present a bit of an example of, of, of somebody making a category mistake here. And of course, uh, you see the image over here. It's going to involve parades. So imagine somebody saying, OK, I see the marching bands. I see the vehicles. I see the dancers. I see the balloons. I see the floats. Right. But where's this parade you said I was going to see? All right. And, and again, that's not a question you'd expect somebody who, you know, 
ever to ask because it seems pretty obvious what a parade is. A parade is the sum total of all of those things. Those are all parts of a parade, the whole thing together. So you're not going to see the bands, the vehicles, the dancers, the balloons, the floats, and a parade. <laughs> you, you're, you are going to see a parade which is consists of the bands, the vehicles, the dancers, the balloons, and the floats, etc. Right. Uh, and so that's where uh, somebody makes a, a category mistake. And it says, while, while we wouldn't imagine anybody ever making that mistake with respect to a parade, we do see people making just exactly that mistake with respect to, uh, to minds and mental states. Uh, so, uh, for example, he might you might say, look, I see all the nerves responsible for sensations. I see the brain's information processing systems. I see all these neurotransmitters, and I see like these hormonal systems that that, that you know uh, do this, that, and the other thing. But 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 where's the mind, right? And uh, uh, Ryle thinks that those are very much the same exact kind of mistake, right? Assuming that like you see all these little bits and then think that the thing is something over and above all of those things uh, uh, in some sort of mystical way, uh, when really it's just that's just it, right? And so just like we don't assume that the parade is something over and above all of the people walking down the street, um, it, the, the mind is nothing over and above, uh, you know, uh, uh, sensory organs, nerve tissue, neural transmitters, etc. So I think uh, after getting a, a very brief look, of course, the text gives you a better uh, a uh, breakdown of Ryle's argumentation, uh, uh, quotes him at, at some reasonable length. Uh, so we get a critique of dualism from Ryle, but I think it, it really helps if we're going to be talking about physicalism in general and some of the other views uh, that the textbook uh, will address in subsequent sections. Uh, it helps to put it all into a, a more uh, straightforward context. And so if we're thinking about the question, okay, what is a mind? Uh, one place we can start is, again, we can start with this idea we get uh, uh, certainly, again, Descartes has this idea, but so do lots of people before Descartes, all the way back to Plato and even before him. Um, uh, they have this dualist idea, this idea there's two kinds of stuff. There's physical stuff and there's there's sort of um, mind, stuff, soul, spirit, etc. What, what, uh, what you, could, you could call it lots of different things. Uh, and in fact, the Greek words that, were, that, that Plato used to describe it are often translated lots of different ways. So... Uh, so again, that's that's if we consider that to be the, the view that we start with. Uh, of course, there are lots of criticisms of the view. There is the mind-body interaction problem that was discussed a couple lectures ago. There's, of course, all of Ryle's problems uh, with uh, with dualism, and uh, and they do they do tend to stack up. And so as a result, um, uh, dualism is is largely uh, among academic uh, philosophers certainly is 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 as close to an abandoned view as you get in philosophy. And that's really saying something. Philosophers don't tend to like to give up on ideas. We don't tend to like to put any down. We don't tend to like to uh, say, oh, well, this idea just probably is not going to work unless we really think there's some very good reasons for doing so. And for the most part, we do think there's some pretty good reasons for, for abandoning something like substance dualism. And so we largely have. And so from there, there are logically speaking two places you can go. So if the problem with dualism is that there are two kinds of stuff, and one of the big problems is you can't fundamentally explain how they interact with each other, you can't uh, make sense of the properties that one is supposed to have and the other is supposed to lack, and you know all those sorts of things. If, if the, the, again, if the fundamental problem is having two kinds of stuff, well then there are two ways out of it. You either give up one kind of stuff or you give up the other kind of stuff. That is, you can either give up the mind stuff or you can give up the physical stuff, right? You, then you'd only got one stuff left and then all the interaction problems and all that stuff, uh, you know, at least all those things go away. And so in fact, that's what uh, philosophers have done. Uh, the road less taken uh, has been this uh, a view known as immaterialism or idealism. That's the view that gives up on matter. It says, okay, there's just no such thing as matter. Everything is an idea, right? Like that's the only thing that really exists are ideas and perceptions and things like that. Um, and it sounds like a strange view, um, and to some extent it is. It's one of those views that 
sounds like it should be very, very easy to make fun of, and and yet it's not nearly as easy to make fun of as it seems like it should be, uh, which makes it tremendously philosophically interesting. Uh, the text doesn't really mention anything about this this view, and uh, this, the photograph that I'm showing you here um, is a photograph of uh, 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 the the Bishop Barclay. Um, it's spelled, it's pronounced uh, uh, Barclay the way you know, like like the you know the NBA commentator personality Charles Barclay. Same, same, but it's not spelled that way. It's spelled B E R K L E Y, right? So Americans would say Berkeley, uh, 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 Englishman, and, and Barclay was an Englishman. Say say Barkley, right? Um, and and the the town in California where there's a prominent university, the University of California at Berkeley, as Americans say, is actually named after uh, this this Barkley slash Berkeley. Uh, and uh, one of his one of the views he is very famous for is is this this idealist or or uh, otherwise called immaterialist view, right? This idea that, that the only thing that really exists are ideas. And um, if you're really interested in this, uh, there's a, a, a work called Three Dialogues Between Hylas and Philonous. Um, um, and and like you're know, like how do you spell? It? Don't worry, Google will fix you if you're anywhere close. Three dialogues between Hylas, H Y L A S, and you'll get there, right? Um, and uh, um, he wrote about it in other ways, but I think the dialogues are probably the most accessible way to read about his ideas and and see to see how they're they're presented. And it's actually it's a very interesting it's a very interesting view. But again, that's that's the road less traveled, and uh, our text doesn't mention it at all. And so that's all I'll say about it. Um, the main line. Uh, the, the main response to all the problems with dualism is to adopt a view known as physicalism, uh, is what I called in this text, uh, otherwise and called in a lot of places materialism. But those are terms for essentially the same view. That is the view that when, especially like in the context of talking about minds, the only thing that exists is matter, right? Like, you know, like, like physical stuff, right? And that's why it's called physicalism or materialism. Now, that said, there's lots of different ways of saying what a mind is that are all they have in common that are that, that they're materialist views or physicalist views. There is not just one kind of physicalism, and there are some profound disagreements within physicalism. But because this has been the main line, because this has been the approach that most philosophers have taken uh, in in uh, the the days since Descartes, um, the there are many, many controversies within physicalism. So, so even though while, while many philosophers might be agreed that that's the way to go, they're not agreed as to what the right kind of physicalism is. And our text uh, covers uh, really two views-ish, right? Um, and so one of those kinds of physicalism that the text uh, sort of references only, only very briefly, I, I wish they uh, went into this a little more, is something that one might call the mind-brain identity theory. Uh, that is the view that minds just are brains, right? That that that's how you explain how uh, you know how we have mental states. You talk about what brains do, uh, and that's again for, to a modern person uh, or to a current person, I should say, that sounds very sensible. In fact, we do the same thing. We talk, we use the word mind and brain almost interchangeably. It's like what's what what is my brain doing today? We'll say when we make a mistake, or what is my mind doing today uh, in the same circumstance? And and nobody sort of bats an eye. But of course, that's only one way of conceptualizing uh, what a what a mind is. Uh, an alternative to the mind-brain identity theory is a view uh, known as functionalism. Um, and uh, some of the photographs I, I have associated with this one uh, are um, uh, on, on the left. Uh, there's a uh, Gilbert. Uh, not Gilbert, that, I, that's uh, Hilary Putnam, sorry, who who sort of is generally credited with uh, coining the term functionalism. Uh, there's Jerry Fodor, who's quoted a lot. He's the one in the middle uh, in in our text. And there's uh, Dennett, who's mentioned a couple of times uh, in this in this section of the text and and other places. You've you've seen Dennett before, uh, but Dennett's a, a a very prominent functionalist, and and this is a very much responsible for a lot of the uh, the theory of mind that that uh, goes under that name. Uh, now, uh, I'm going to be talking uh, more about each of these things in detail, so I'm not going to fill in some of those details here. I just want you to see where they kind of fit in. Notice the mind-brain identity theory and functionalism, they're both materialist theories. They just disagree with each other about, about a number of things. What they don't disagree about is that is that there's only matter. There's only physical stuff. That's all there is. Um, but, uh, but they do disagree about how to uh, use that to explain what a mind is and, and, and all that. So... Uh, Another a view that the text really does mention and talk a lot about is a view called eliminative materialism, 
Um, and uh, just a, a couple of bones to pick there. Uh, the text talks about that view without really introducing it as a as a version of the mind brain identity view, which it is. Um, and so I think it's it's a lot clearer if you introduce the mind brain identity view, then say, oh, one sub variety of the mind brain identity view is this uh, view called limitative materialism. And the other sort of bone to pick I have is that they mention only and quote only Paul Churchland when uh, in in reality both Paul and his wife Patricia uh, were both quite instrumental in developing the view. They both, uh, they published a lot of things together and they both published independently lots of articles about, uh, uh, about you know, uh, essentially of philosophy in the intersections of neurology and, and philosophy of mind and all that sort of stuff. They're, um, you know, quite, uh, quite prominent, both of them. Uh, and to, to just sort of like, I think, write Patricia out of the picture is, uh, I don't know, I thought it was irksome, um, but there you go. So that, those are, that's, that's who's photographed there, of course, Patricia and uh, Paul Churchland left to right. So let's talk first about the mind-brain identity theory. Let's get, get clear on what, what each of these different kinds of materialist view really are and what they entail uh, and fill out a little bit of what's going on in the text. So the mind-brain identity theory is, is, again, as I've said earlier, very briefly, the view that minds and brains are identical. That is, that they are the same thing, right? That's, that's hence the name, mind-brain identity. And I've uh, picked a couple of uh, quick quotations, I think, that, that really encapsulate uh, the, the nuts and bolts of the view. Of course, there are lots of more complicated issues uh, that we don't need to go into at the moment, but, but this will this encapsulate the, the basics. Um, so the first, I mean, this is this is not a, a brand new view. This is a, a view with a sort of a long pedigree, um, and uh, uh, one one particular uh, place where you can see it expressed fairly clearly is in an address that was given by Thomas Henry Huxley in 1874. And he says this. He says uh, he was he says it, it is quite true that to the best of my judgment. The argumentation which applies to brutes, it's a term used at the time to mean non-human animals like cats, dogs, squirrels, rabbits, whatever. He says, uh, the, the argument which applies to them holds equally good of men, meaning humans, and therefore that all states of consciousness in us, as in them, are immediately caused by molecular changes of the brain substance. Right. So Huxley was a biologist. He thought that minds and mental states and thinking were biological phenomena, uh, that it's our brains that do certain things that are responsible for us thinking, and that when cats and dogs and rats and squirrels and lizards and whatever, what have you, when those things, you know, when, when they act in the world, right, their brains are also doing things that allow that to happen. And the, those basic activities are fundamentally similar, right? Uh, so yes, maybe, you know, certainly lizards aren't going to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, solving the a quadratic equation. Um, but, right, <laughs> they are going to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, responding to stimuli with, by you know, actually processing information and, and doing things like that. And so, um, uh, yeah, our brains are, 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 are much more sophisticated, certainly much larger, um, you know, much uh, organized in such a way as to, that they can do things that lizards can't, but they're, they're both brains that, you know, brains are a piece of biology um, uh, that, that arose by a long process of natural selection, et cetera, et cetera, right? So um, that's, that's, that's uh, uh, Huxley's view, and, and it's a mind-brain identity view. Uh, also in this is a, a, a more a more modern, a more current, contemporary in this case author, uh, who's uh, the Australian philosopher J.J.C. Smart, who's uh, long been a, a proponent of the mind-brain identity theory. And he puts it this way, um, uh, he says, uh, the identity theory of mind holds that states and processes of the mind are identical to states and processes of the brain. Here I take identifying mind and brain as being a matter of identifying processes and perhaps states of the mind and brain. Consider an experience of pain or of seeing something or of having a mental image. The identity theory of mind is to the effect that these experiences just are brain processes and not merely correlated with brain processes. Uh, and I, again, I think that's that's fairly clear. Uh, this quotation, by the way, comes from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy's entry on the mind-brain identity theory. The Standard Encyclopedia, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy is a resource uh, mostly written by and for professional philosophers for each other uh, so that we can, you know, sort of uh, get the basic idea of something that we're new to without having to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we can see what some of the important works are. There's a very extensive bibliographies here. It's a really great place to start uh, if you're 
doing some philosophical research, and the entry on the mind brain identity theory is authored by JJC Smart. Right, so that's um, uh, it's uh, it's hard to get sort of a better uh, contemporary authority for that view, and that's what he says the view is, and and he's right. That's that's totally what the view is. Um, so anyway, th that's that's very briefly the mind brain identity theory. And so now we can move into uh, into a sub variety of it that the text talks about kind of a lot, and that is uh, the view known as eliminative materialism. Uh, this is this is the view of the Churchlands. The Churchlands view, um, uh, the the eliminative materialist view, starts with the idea of of something called. It talks. They talk a lot about something called folk psychology, right? And I think it's it's really important to to get what in the world that is. And so, in order to talk about folk psychology, I want to talk about some other sort of folk theories that people really do have, and that that begins with folk physics. That is, there's a way that people assume that the world works. Uh, that they don't, they don't, it's not from careful testing, it's not from careful experiment, it's just from sort of basically living in the world and, and all that, right? It's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's the kind of, you know, really intuitive way that we understand the world. And, and some parts of that intuitive worldview are, are in fact false. Um, and so, for example, among our folk physics, which uh, in some ways is the, the kind of physics you get in like the Wiley e. Coyote and Roadrunner cartoons, um, is, 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 you know, as far as so, like we we have this idea, what goes up must come down, right? Uh, and of course, that's not literally true, uh, but but that's again part of our common sort of understanding of the way the world works that we get from watching medium-sized things operate on medium-length time scales. Um, you know, uh, uh, most of the time, right? That's that's kind of how we we get this this worldview. Um, a dropped object falls. A dropped object falls straight down. Um, and of course, it, it doesn't doesn't really do that. Uh, it just appears to in many cases. Um, uh, really, it follows a kind of space time curve, right? But it's not again, that's not obvious until you use more concept more conceptual abstractions. Um, a solid object cannot pass through another solid object, right? That's true. <laughs> that's what it means for something to be solid. Right? Uh, that's part of our folk physics that's not not really usually most of a problem mostly a problem um, heavy things fall faster than light things that's a thing that's very common for people to think uh, people are surprised when that doesn't happen but of course um, if you've been if you remember your high school physics course that that's that's not actually true um, uh, heavy things and light things fall at the same rate in the same gravity um, you know, there, there are videos of people standing on the moon where there's no air, and that's no air resistance, uh, dropping a hammer into feather and having them fall at the same rate. And so um, it's one of the things that Galileo is famous for demonstrating. Um, an object is either at rest or moving in some absolute sense, right? Uh, again, physicists no longer think this, but it is part of our intuitive worldview. Um, uh, so uh, things like the, the theory of relativity uh, really sort of uh, bust this notion up. Uh, and the same same with this one. We we sort of believe that two events are either simultaneous, that is, they're either happening at the same time, or they aren't. Um, but of course, uh, again, when you consider uh, some of the things we know from relativity, that's not actually as clear as all that, right? So what, some of the things we mean by simultaneity are are actually not not right. Um, and so again, these are but these are these are the basic ways that we kind of tend to think about uh, about the way the world works, and some of them are false. Um, and in fact, kind of a lot of them are, are false, at least in some subtle way. Uh, and, and we've 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 overturned some of those things in the way that we think about physics from from a more scientific perspective. We also have a folk biology, that is, we have a set of assumptions that we tend to apply to the natural world, uh, such as that living things have an essence and non-living things don't. Um, I mean, no biologist takes that seriously. They like the difference between there's there's actually kind of a spectrum of living and non-living things, and there are things that inhabit gray areas, uh, like viruses, for example, that fit some criteria for living things and don't fit other criteria for living things, uh, and so on and so forth. And there's 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 a bit of a, a, a there's a bit of a gray area there. Um, and, uh, and certainly, it's not the case that living things have some kind of identifiable essence. That there's, no, there's nothing measurable. Uh, there's nothing quantifiable. There's nothing visible or smellable. That that is the difference between living and non-living things. Um, we tend to believe that similarity in appearance means similarity of essence. 
uh, a lot of that underlies our thinking about things like dog breeds, right? We think that if a dog looks a certain way, that it must behave a certain way. Uh, and of course, we even carry this through to people. We assume that people who look a certain way must be a certain way. Uh, and that's, of course, not true. Uh, it's not true of dogs, and it's not true of human beings either. Um, but uh, but it is, it's part of our folk biology. It's, it's a natural way that we have a strong tendency to think, even if it isn't correct. Um, and uh, we also think that living things are organized into categories, right? And then those categories are organized into hierarchies. Um, and that gives you things like, uh, you know, very, very uh, old views that say, for example, dolphins and, and sharks and everything, they're all fish, right? They, they have something in common, they all belong in the same family tree. And of course, um, if you know something about the uh, evolutionary history of, 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 you know, dolphins, for example, uh, you know that they're very, they're, they're very, very distantly related to sharks. In fact, they're more closely related to cows than they are to sharks. Um, um, and because uh, they're mammals, right? And uh, uh, sharks are um, uh, not mammals. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, look, all vertebrates have a common ancestor for way back, but that's about as that's about as closely related as, as, as sharks and dolphins are, even though there's lots of ways in which they look similar. So our folk biology fools us in a lot of ways, too, where, I mean, you can kind of see the sense it sort of makes, but it's, it's largely it's largely false. Um, and so just like our folk physics and our folk biology are largely false, so too, uh, it seems, you might want to say, is our folk psychology. You might say our folk psychology is is sort of radic, you know, may, maybe slightly false, maybe radically false. Uh, the Churchlands, uh, especially Paul Churchland, tend to think that it's radically false. And so our folk psychology uh, in, in includes like essentially all the ways that we think about and talk about minds and mental states, right? We talk about our beliefs and desires that are that are working together to form intentions that lead to our actions. Uh, we talk about uh, hopes and fears and uh, you know uh, all sorts of things, and we think of those as um, you know as as, as real events like you know and pains and pleasures and uh, you know thoughts and memories and all that sort of stuff we think of those as as real things that a scientific theory could could talk about and use intelligibly and in fact our science of psychology uses most of those terms terms that are imported from our folk psychology although they tend to use those things with a little bit more precision than we tend to use them every day and so one of the main points here is um, that uh, that folk psychology, that you know, again, the way that we have been talking about minds for for a long time, uh, constitutes a kind of theory about what minds are like, just like our folk physics is a kind of theory about the the the, the material world, and our folk biology is a kind of theory about the living world. Um, and so our folk psychology is a kind of theory about minds. And if we really do use folk psychology to sort of predict and explain behavior, then we're sort of committing ourselves to the idea that there really are such things as beliefs and desires and hopes and fears and, and, and pains and memory, etc. Right. And you might be thinking to yourself, okay, so far so good. So so what? Yes, I, we, I do think that there are such things. Well, again, most people do, but uh, that's what makes uh, uh, the Churchland's view pretty interesting. So uh, among among uh, uh, other things, the the uh, criticize folk psychology uh, for having quite a lot of different uh, defects and, and problems, um, and uh, I'll, I'll just mention a couple. So among the among the the problems that uh, um, the Churchlands have with folk psychology is that the idea that folk psychology is not advanced in thousands of years. Okay. Um, and uh, you should contrast other kinds of medical theories about this one. Um, and so, so f for example, um, uh, if, if imagine that you're uh, like a, a medical doctor today, if you were to try and read the medical textbooks of, uh, of Galen, who is an ancient Greek physician, uh, you'd be really, really confused. Uh, even again, even if you had, were you had a really excellent knowledge of, of today's medicine, and the reason you'd be very confused is because the terminology is not the same as we use today. A lot of the assumptions uh, about what what human bodies were and were like and were made of and how they functioned, and even a lot of names for anatomical terms are totally different. And so you'd have to you'd have to really study the historical context before you could even understand Galen's treatises about medicine. Again, even if you are trained as a medical doctor. Um, whereas 
you can read the oldest of all documents about people's minds and it's completely intelligible. Literally anybody can read them. All right. So think of something like De Anima, uh, right? Uh, uh, you know, or at least a translation of De Anima by, you know, uh, by Aquinas. Or if you go all the way back to what Aristotle wrote about minds, I mean, it's, it's completely readable these days. Again, as long as it's translated into a language you can read. Um, and, uh, and by the way, the translation doesn't really have anything to do with making it intelligible. It's just, you know, um, it's it's uh, it, it, we kind of think and talk the same way about minds and mental states that we have for thousands of years, and uh, um, you know Paul you know uh, Paul Churchland and, and among others would ask, well, what what are the odds that, that, that we're right? Um, and and you know considering how how often um, uh, you know other scientific fields change right what what's uh, you know considered to be the the the, the state of our knowledge um it, it would be surprising if we just happened to have gotten it right thousands of years ago with minds and mental states um and so uh if you're curious about the the, the photograph in this one this is a, a depiction of uh, something called mesmerism so uh, the the it, the 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 term sort of sticks around in, in English as sort of being mesmerized or something like that. Uh, but once upon a time, it was it was regarded as, you know, like actual sort of medical science. <laughs> and uh, again, if you were to read a treatise about mesmerism now, you'd it's like, OK, what? <laughs> right. Again, even if you're trained as a doctor, you're like if you don't know anything about the historical context, it's just not intelligible. Uh, again, unlike treatises about minds. Um, interesting story about this one that uh, uh, you should you should definitely look up the story of mesmerism uh, because it involves uh, one of the first uh, really really nice recorded instances of the use of blind testing, uh, which is uh, now a staple of scientific experiments, especially those to do with uh, with medical effects and psychological effects. Um, and uh, at the center of the story is is uh, actually Benjamin Franklin uh, of all people. And so. One of the things that uh, the Churchlands are um, uh, on about with respect to our folk psychology is, again, they think it's a radically false theory, almost certainly, and uh, they believe that the theory, uh, the, the terms that we, we use will eventually simply just be eliminated, right, which is why the view is called eliminative materialism, right, uh, so, so we're finally getting to the whole point behind the name. And so there's a difference between eliminating and reducing uh, some of our scientific terms or the terms we use as part of a theory. Uh, and so the way this goes is that sometimes as theories develop, whether they be theories in physics or biology or chemistry or whatever, as theories develop, some of their elements are, are entirely eliminated based on, on the way that people's thinking tends to change or uh, certain findings occur. For example, uh, the substance uh, known as phlogiston was once thought to be responsible for combustion, that is for fire, okay? Uh, they, they thought, okay, no, you got a piece of wood, it's rich in phlogiston, and once the phlogiston all leaves, you've got all this ash, there's no more phlogiston left, right? Um, and, and that was, again, that was considered scientific, you know, uh, uh, the, the, it was considered scientific fact at one point. Um, and after the discovery of oxygen by uh, Lavoisier uh, and its role in combustion, uh, phlogiston was essentially eliminated from scientific theory. Nobody uses the term anymore. Nobody uses even a synonym for the term anymore. It's just gone. It's been eliminated okay, uh, from, from, from all consideration. It's just not a thing. Uh, similar examples include like uh, uh, ether, right? You know, physicists no longer talk about the ether. Um, it's just not a thing, right? There's not, it's not like we've replaced the term ether with a different term that's more precise or something like that. We just don't say anything about it anymore because they just don't think there is any ether, never was. Um, and uh, uh, biologists used to talk about the elan vital, that is something that may, that, that, that living things had that non-living things didn't, like an actual, like, substance or something and uh, they no longer talk about that it's not like they use a different term now it's just it's just gone right so such things have been eliminated from our talk because they've been eliminated from our theories All right that's that's elimination sometimes what happens to our terminology as our knowledge advances is um, that some of their elements are retained, but they're reduced to other theoretical elements. That is, sometimes we still use the, the term, but we no longer think it's, think it's a thing in and of itself, or we sort of change the definition of it, right? So certainly people talked about water before they knew it was H2O, 
Uh, and now we define water as H2O, but we still use the word water, right? And so we've changed our concept a little bit, um, uh, but we haven't really eliminated it. We've sort of reduced it to chemistry, right? We've reduced it. We say there's nothing special about water. Water is one of a, a number of things that chemistry applies to. Another example, uh, lightning, right? Lightning, again, was once thought to be a thing in and of itself. And eventually, concepts about lightning were reduced to concepts about electricity in general. Again, we still talk about lightning, we still use the term, uh, but we mean something differently by it than we used to, right? We mean now lightning is an electrical discharge, not, you know, perhaps whatever people used to think lightning was. Um, and, and we think lightning is, is just one of a number of things that are explainable uh, by somebody who understands what electricity is and how it works, um, and not just a thing in and of itself. So lightning has gotten reduced to, uh, electromagnetic theory in physics and um, uh, you know uh, whereas something like phlogiston has just been eliminated from our scientific theory so the churchlands believe that uh, a lot of our, our mentalistic vocabulary that is talk about beliefs and fears and hopes and desires and pains and all that sort of stuff will eventually just be eliminated rather than reduced uh, but of course, it, you know, it could go either way. It, it might be a mix of the two, but they think that the, the, those, those folk psychological terms that we use will be largely eliminated because they're just, they're, they're as wrong as, as ether and phlogiston, et cetera. Um, and so that's, that's, that's a view. Okay. All right, now for uh, the other view that the text talks in some detail about, and that is a view known as functionalism. Now, uh, the first thing I want to do when talking about functionalism is uh, be very clear as to why anybody would want a view other than the mind-brain identity view, right? Why, why somebody would ever even be looking? Because again, if you're going to be trying to figure out, you know, human minds, right? Well, I mean, all all human beings have human brains, and so like, why why bother with a theory other than the minds are brains theory? Well, <laughs> here here's why, okay. Uh, uh, functionalism arises out of the thought that the mind-brain identity theory is just too restrictive, right? That it's that it's unnecessarily restrictive. That it that it limits our thinking about what a mind is to only human beings, right? And you might say, well, look, everything that I know of that has a mind is a human being. It's like, well, you know, or or is some other kind of Earth life or something? You know, it's like, well, okay, let's let's stretch our imaginations a little bit. Uh, so in this case, the mind-brain identity theory seems, again, it restricts the existence of minds only to humans, or at least to very human-like things. Uh, and uh, we want to be able to concept, we might want to be able to conceptualize uh, things that are that are further from that as, as, as literally, as, as actually having minds. And so uh, here, here's what we mean by that. Uh, so let's talk about some other kinds of minds that uh, we might want to have some theoretical machinery that, that can actually handle. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you that these 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 examples all come from the universe of science fiction. And lest that put you off, just keep in mind that that uh, uh, science fiction gets its ideas from things that look might, after all, in some sense, be true. And so uh, so there's certainly that. Uh, so I'm going to put uh, some some photographs up here. And uh, if this is a this is a fun one. If you can if you can immediately identify at least three of these four, uh, you get to keep your nerd card, right? If you can't identify at least three of them, uh, uh, like just right away, then um, then I don't. I'm afraid you'll have to turn it in uh, until you can sort of see some more uh, television and films. Um, in any case, uh, the the two on the left there are are clearly depictions of you know aliens, that is non-human life forms. Uh, now, of course, in the movies and television shows, in fact, these are two, both two from films, uh, but in the movies in which these two characters occur, um, they are of course played by human actors, uh, but that's, you know, that's just part of the magic of Hollywood. They only look like they're aliens, right? Uh, so, but the deal is, I mean, could there be somewhere out there, something that is not a human being, that like walks and talks and does things that make sense and you know like curses when they stub their toes and, and and yada 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 right and of course the answer is yes of course such things could exist and if they did wouldn't it be silly of us to have a theory of mind that said that only human that they didn't have minds right and that's that's part of the thought behind functionalism is this and maybe we, maybe maybe we don't want to be so restrictive and say that minds are brains because who's to say what these aliens have right maybe they have something that's maybe a little bit brain-like but surely it'll work differently than ours 
And so, but don't we want to say that they have mental states, even if what they have on a physical level is different than what we have? The answer is sh sure, you know, and that's that's where functionalists really come from. If you look at the two photos on on the right here, uh, um, uh, well, let's identify them actually. So uh, the, the the one on the far left, that's Lou Gossett Jr. is the human actor who plays a character named Drac in a film called Enemy Mine, came out in 1985. I would say out of those four, it's probably the most obscure. I think few, it's it's, it's certainly the least famous these days. Um, and if you haven't seen the movie, I, I very highly recommend it. It's actually it's a quite it's a good movie. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, I've noticed something of a paradox whenever I bring up films in classes or things like that. If something came out like last year, most people have seen it somehow. And, but if something came out like before they were born, like they've had their entire lives to see it and yet they haven't seen it. It's this weird paradox. Like the longer somebody has had to see a film, the less likely they are to have seen it. It's, um, like I said, it's, it's a little, it's a little paradoxical. Uh, but it's, it's a, like I said, Enemy of Mine's a good film. You should, see, you should see it. Uh, also, uh, this is, uh, you might actually recognize the actor here. It's like, isn't that Professor Snape? It's like, well, no, it's Alan Rickman who played Professor Snape. Yeah, it's the, it's the same actor. Uh, he's played a character named Sir Alexander Dane in, a, in the film Galaxy Quest, which came out in 1999. Uh, also a tremendously good film. Um, and uh, I think it's Rickman's best role, but uh, I'm sure people argue with me on that one. Uh, moving to the right. So we've got the, these other two characters on the right. We have uh, uh, the... Um, the character Lieutenant Commander Data from Star Trek. Again, I, I would say it's probably the most likely to be identified, uh, being pretty iconic. It's a pretty major, um, uh, a pretty major character in a pretty major television series. It ran from 1987 through 1994. Um, and uh, uh, the interesting thing about the character Data is that he's an android, right? He is he's he's an artificial being, right? He's he has a positronic circuitry and not you know blood and and guts and and wetware and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but he walks and he talks and he, you know, does things that make sense and, you know, um, is in some cases even co cognitively better than us. Uh, and, and so, you know, but certainly we, we think, yeah, he has mental states. Um, and uh, that's the kind of thing. Where, does he have a brain? Well, no, <laughs> or at least not anything like yours or mine. It's all positronic circuitry, as they say in the, in the parlance of the show. Um, but, um, but yeah, so I will say here, uh, just again, revealing a little bit of Hollywood magic, the, the way they were able to get the Android data to, to look and act so human-like is that he was in fact played by a, a human actor, uh, named Brent Spiner, who did a, just a, a brilliant job with the character. So, you know, sorry for any spoilers there. That's, that's the magic of Hollywood. That's how it works. Um, the one on the right is also pretty easy to identify because of course the name is written on the top. That's HAL 9000. HAL, HAL is a, a computer, right? An AI uh, is what we would say nowadays. Um, uh, he was in the film 2001 A Space Odyssey, which came out in 1968. And, um, uh, that's a, it's it's a I would say it's a more important movie than it is a good movie. Um, it's a it's a, it's a kind of sci-fi classic, but again I think it's more of an important movie than it is a good movie. I actually think its sequel was was much better as a movie. Uh, the sequel was 2010. It came out many years later, and I know people might throw rocks at me for that one, but I you know I I'll stand by it. So in any case, uh, Hal is is he's an AI, right? And and again, does he have a brain? Well, no, <laughs> it's nothing like what you or I have. But uh, he 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 doesn't walk anyway. But he does talk and he does things that sort of make sense. And you know, um, and uh, you know, as as, as you have a conversation with him and all that sort of stuff. Um, but. Um, uh, but yeah, so again, these are the kinds of things where you say, like, well, gosh, this is all science fiction stuff. Well, yes, but especially when we're considering, you know, artificial beings and AIs and non-human aliens, these are all things that are at least things that we might conceptually run across at least at some point. Like maybe maybe we, we won't ever run across any other aliens, but that doesn't mean they're not there, right? Uh, uh, maybe maybe we won't ever uh, develop some kind of uh, actual AI. I, I think it would be very weird if we didn't. Um, that, that would be an interesting question. Like why, why, why isn't this working? Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, I think those sorts of things are closer now than certainly they were 10 years ago. And um, and uh, there's a lot of discussion about AI, uh, you know, around the now. Uh, and so, again, the question is, don't we want to have a theory of mind that can handle that? Because the mind, the mind brain identity theory really can't. So here's here's the way to put it. So a a aliens, androids, or AIs might plausibly have mental states, but they certainly don't have brains like ours. So the mind brain identity theory has to be too narrow of a definition for what a mind is. That's what functionalists will say. So instead of saying that a mental state is what a particular set of matter is, like the mind brain identity theory says, 
in, uh, instead, we should say that perhaps what a mental state a mental state is what a particular set of matter does, right? And that's where functionalism comes in. So functionalism as a view is given its name because it believes that mental states are functions. And if you think about, gosh, where have I seen functions before? And if you're thinking mathematics, that's that's exactly what it, it's the same concept. It's the same word. A function in mathematics is something that uh, takes in an input and gives you an output, right? It's, a, it's an input output relation. Um, that's the way it's used in math. That's the way it's used in, in this context too, right? So it's something that takes in an input, gives you an output. That's a function. And so the functionalist view of mental states is that the mental state is a kind of black box that will turn certain inputs into certain outputs. Right? That's, that's, the, that's the, the basic idea of functionalism. So instead of saying that a mind is a brain, the functionalist will say, no, 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 a, a mental state is a function, right? It's a thing that turns input into output somehow. The term black box is a, an engineering term and uh, here's here's how it essentially works, right? Um, when engineers are designing things, a lot of times they'll use a, what they call a black box, right, as as a kind of stand-in for something that does a thing, right? So imagine that you're an engineer and you're designing a, a system, uh, and part of that system in, involves a thermostat, right? So a thermostat is a device that will tell you what the temperature is, will turn something off when a temperature is a certain temperature, and then will turn something on when something is a certain temperature. Um, and so that's what a thermostat is. That's what it does. Of course, there's lots of different ways to make a thermostat. You can use a bimetallic coil, and some some older older houses have those, and they work just fine. Um, uh, sometimes you have a sort of alcohol or, or mercury thermometer as part of a thermostat. You can make it that way. Some houses have those. They work perfectly fine. Uh, sometimes you can use a digital thermometer, right? Again, some houses have those, they work perfectly fine. Uh, but the idea is that like somehow it's supposed to take the temperature, somehow it's supposed to switch something on or off. It could be a physical switch, it could be a kind of a certain kind of electric circuit, it could be a kind of radio signal, it could be any number. It's like again, when you're designing the system, in a lot of ways you might not care. Right? You might not care what kind of a thermostat is, as long as it will turn something on at a certain temperature and turn something off at another temperature. Um, and so, again, that's where that's where the concept of a black box comes in. And so for a functionalist, that's what mental states are. They're mental state that they'll take an input, they give an output, they kind of don't really care how it does it. Right? And, and think, look, you could have lots of things that do that thing. Um, and so uh, the input in, in the case of mental states we're talking about is stimulus. Right, that is, you know, things you see and hear in your environment, and things that people tell you, and all that sort of stuff. And then the output is behavior, like what you actually do and what you say, and all that sort of stuff. Right. So that's that's the sense. That's the the general functionalist picture of what a mental state is. Notice they don't say a mental state is a brain, right? A, a brain state. They say no, no, no. A mental state is whatever whatever takes in a certain kind of input and gives you sort of output. How, however, that is actually uh, physically constituted. And so what that brings in is a concept known as multiple realizability. This is this is a, an important concept in functionalism, right? Functionalists all think uh, that uh, mental states are, as they say, multiply realizable. Um, and what that means is 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 that you can perform that the the same function could be performed by lots of different physical systems. A little bit like I just talked about with thermostats. Another example includes uh, something like this. So if you look at this device here and this one here, and this one here, and that one there, uh, you'll notice that physically speaking, in terms of in terms of like the parts of which these things are made, and the way that those parts interact with each other, um, they have nothing in common, right? There's, you know, um, uh, the ones on the left and right, you're like, oh, they have hands and, and stuff like that. Yes, but nothing else really does. Um, and uh, uh, you know, it's, the hands move on, on, on both the clock and the wristwatch, but of course, the internal mechanism is probably very different. Uh, this one probably uses a lot of gears. This one probably uses a small electric motor and, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, and of course, your, your, the time readout on your phone doesn't contain any moving parts, right? The only moving part on your phone are the buttons, right? The physical buttons, if you have them, and um, the, uh, the, 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 the electric motor inside that makes your phone vibrate. That's just a, a, an off-balance electric motor. Um, but that's it <laughs> in terms of moving parts in your phone um, and yet you know it's going to give you a time readout and of course a sundial has no moving parts I mean I, I, unless you count the earth right um, but uh, but that's not you know <laughs> not typically uh, uh, 
you know, it's a very different moving part, certainly, than the hands of a, of a clock or something like that. Um, and so, again, physically speaking, in terms of like the physical way, the parts that these things are made of and how those parts are put together, they have absolutely nothing in common. But they do all perform the same function. That is, they tell you what time it is. Um, and so that's, again, that's that's this notion of multiple realizability, uh, this idea that uh, we'll, we'll define it here on the next slide. Uh, multiple realizability is the idea that any given function can be performed by more than one physical system. All right. So to sort of bring this all together, again, remember functionalists think of mental states as a kind of black box where you take a certain kind of input, you give a certain kind of output, and you can you can have different sort of physical systems in there. So here there's a picture of the inside of a vacuum tube radio, which a radio, notice, um, takes in radio waves and puts out sound waves. Here's a picture of a transistor radio, fundamentally different kind of technology from the, uh, from the vacuum tubes, does the same thing. It takes in the same input, that is radio waves, gives you the same output, that is sound. And in fact, when you put the same radio waves into it, you get the same sound out of it. You really can't tell the difference. Fundamentally different physical systems, same input-output relation. We say they're functionally equivalent, right? They do the same thing. They perform the same function. So likewise, uh, when you've got this, uh, you know, again, the black box being the mental state, you can have stimulus going in and behavior coming out. And you can have that whether the uh, whether the input goes into a physical brain and, and that causes uh, all the behaviors and everything like that, or whether that same input uh, goes into something else and uh, causes then the same output. Right, so that's functionalism. Uh, that's roughly how it works. That's the the, the, the basic idea, um, and uh, refer to the sort of diagram from earlier to see where functionalism fits in, uh, sort of in the context of all of these other views. And so this has gone on for a while because um, uh, it's covered a lot of territory, a lot of big ideas in here, um, and. Uh, I'll, I'll just sort of end this lecture the way that uh, the author ends this this section of the text by uh, uh, quoting uh, uh, Richard Brown here, and so uh, the, Brown puts it puts it, I think succinctly here. He says, "So where are we with respect to dualism versus physicalism?" Um, I think it's safe to say that at this time in history, most philosophers and scientists are physical, physicalists of one sort or another. Right? We know that there are many sorts of physicalists, and there's at least a couple uh, at play uh, in just you know this section of the text. And uh, they think that and and uh, think that we will ultimately come to believe that the mind is just physical. Okay, that's all physicalists. Most agree that we need to pay close attention to the empirical sciences. That's generally true. Uh, but of course, we also need to pay close attention to our own phenomenological experiences, uh, as we will need to fully understand both if we are ever to see the relation between the two.